to Talk in the Park, Conversations with Paul and Noel, where we gather to think out loud about what it means to follow Jesus in our world. I'm your host, Paul Pyle, Pastor of Discipleship at Patterson Park Church. I'm joined by my co-host, Noel Burke, one of the elders in our fellowship. Noel, tell us what we'll be talking about in this episode. Yeah, so we are going to do our first book review, and we are going to be looking at the book Impossible Christianity by Kevin DeYoung. And uh, the, the beginning says, why following Jesus does not mean you have to change the world, be an expert in everything, accept spiritual failure, and feel miserable pretty much all of the time. So, Paul, uh, yet when, you, when you read that, you think, this is my kind of book. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, when I read that subtitle, he caught me. Uh, that, that subtitle, I thought, oh, that's me. That's so many people I know. You know, they're, they feel frustrated. They feel like they're not doing enough. And he's on to something. So I, I wrote a review in the blog. I put this book on our on a bookshelf. And now here we are talking about it on the podcast. So I really like this book. If we get enough feedback, I'd like to restock the bookshelf. I think we're down to just a couple of copies now of Impossible Christianity by Kevin DeYoung. Okay. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's introduce this book. I want to read a, a quote. Uh, I believe it's from uh, chapter one. It says, many Christians have resigned themselves to the fact, or at least it seems like a fact, that they will be failures as followers of Jesus. Forgiven, yes. Justified, yes. On their way to heaven, yes. But as disciples and Christians, nothing special. We will do the best we can with our limited time, our limited ability, and our limited opportunities. And yet, we will never have the requisite gifts to be truly successful. We will never pray enough. We will never give enough. We will never share our faith enough. We will not renew our city. We will not repair all that ails our nation. We will not change the world. Now, if you're not depressed after that, you know, that intro, but I, I have to imagine that all of our listeners probably resonate with that. Oh, that's how I feel. Yeah, I think some ears perked up just as you were reading that quote. And you can tell from the writing, he is a good writer. He, he communicates well. But just think about our exemplars, the people that we look up to. Uh, you think about uh, suffering Christians. I was just teaching a class last week and found out that two of the students in the class are Chinese students, uh, exchange students, and their parents are uh, part of the house church movement, and their whole family has been arrested. Oh, man. And, you know, this is the kind of thing you hear about it, and here I met these two kids, and here they are dealing with that anxiety, suffering Christians. We have the exemplars of the sacrificing Christians. You think of Hudson Taylor and all that he gave up to reach China. Uh, you think of Elizabeth Elliot and uh, all that tragedy with the death of her husband and four yeah. other men. Uh, you think of the super Christians, uh, the, the ones who spend an hour with God in the word daily, uh, the ones who read through the Bible every year. And we all know people like that. And we, I can never be like that. You think of the game changer Christians, uh, William Wilberforce, Martin Luther King Jr., Billy Graham, these people who are actually moved the dial on, on uh, world history. And we look at that and we say, wait. What am I? Who am I? Uh, what can I do to contribute in my ordinary life? So I think he laid his finger on a real problem. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, too. I, I just thought of this. You know, you hear the secular world often compare themselves of, well, at least I'm not Hitler. Hitler's like the worst person ever. And as long as I'm less bad than Hitler, I'm good. It's this curve. And then we do the same thing as Christians of, well, compared to these, you know, people who have just done amazing things. Like, I, I am a substandard Christian. Yep. Yeah. So, okay, um, Kevin uh, comments that we, we almost have this pre-programmed notion that, you know, we, we have to change the world. You know, if, if you become a Christian, you have to do something incredible um, that we— you know, that is the standard for being faithful to God. And if you don't do something incredible and make your mark on the world, then, you know, maybe you haven't, you know, done well. Uh, is that a right assumption about God's expectations for us? You know, Noel, I'm 67 years old, and I just heard somebody go through stages of discovery on a, on a podcast I was listening to. And they said, once you get to my age, you've lost the idealism of youth 
and all of that energy and all that naivete, mm. and you're in a different place. And I, I realize that more, the older I get, the more I realize, no, God has not called me to change the world. And he's not even called me to change my world. Mm. He's called me to be faithful in what he's given to me to do. Uh, the, my family, the people I minister with, and two here at Patterson Park, I want to be faithful in that. Let him take care of the results. But that change the world paradigm is pretty intimidating for a lot of Christians, I think. Interesting. Yeah, no, I, and I, I imagine that, uh, that there are many people listening to this podcast who have not yet hit that shift in their paradigm. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I feel like I'm kind of teetering on that where I still have that youthful passion and, and energy. But there are days that I wake up and I'm thinking, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I'm tired. Uh, there's a lot going on. So, yeah, that's that's helpful. Um, okay, so one of the things that I, I found interesting is in um, – this is on uh, pages 16 through 21. He he speaks about these common mistakes that we hold as uh, as Christians in our faith. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to list them off. They're, uh, number one, we can be good enough uh, to get into heaven. And these are mistakes, just just to clarify. We can be good enough to get into heaven. Number two, Christians can be perfect. Number three, sin is not a big deal. Number four, being a Christian is trouble-free. Number five, we should stop being so hard on ourselves. Number six, there is no cost to following Jesus. Hmm. And seven, God will never call you to take any risks. Risks, sorry. Um, so you're, you know, you're a pastor, you meet with people in the congregation regularly. Um, you know, you're walking through these difficult journeys with them. What are some of the common mistakes that you hear regularly as you're rubbing shoulders with people? I think all of those seven misconceptions fall broadly into the categories of things we, we, it just reminds me of something I heard in college when one of my professors said, Sometimes if you just articulate your assumptions out loud, as soon as you say them aloud, you realize they're ridiculous. Mm. And that's really true. And some of those, as you read them, people would say, oh, yeah, that's ridiculous. I don't believe that. But those assumptions still are always, you know, they're circulating. They're kind of simmering there in the background. And we don't realize they become part of our spiritual operating system. Mm. And those assumptions are still there. Uh, The assumption that uh, I've got to do more, try harder. Do more, try harder is not good news. It's not the gospel. Mm. It's a misunderstanding of the gospel. I mean, uh, the the fact that Christ has died for us is not just how we get into the family of God. It's it's how we how we function. It's how it's the mainspring of our spiritual formation. Christ has died for us, and the Spirit is working in us, and we work out of that, not out of a, a sense that we need to do more, try harder, or one of my favorites is checklist spirituality, hmm. where you reduce spiritual formation to a, a list of tasks to be accomplished. Now, that appeals to high achievers, yeah. and they'll go after it, and then that tempts them to a kind of arrogant spirituality that is ugly to everybody, to God and to everybody else around. That spirituality is ugly, or it, it's intimidating to people. Yeah. And that checklist spirituality either leads to arrogance or despair. And neither one of those is the goal of spiritual formation. So I think do hard, do more, try harder, and checklist spirituality are, are real enemies to spiritual formation. Yeah, and I, and I, would, I, I am the first to admit that if, uh, if Christianity was a checklist, I would fail. It's oh. like, oh, well, you're an elder. Aren't you supposed to have everything right. you know, together and figured out? No, I am a sinner saved by God's grace just like every other Christian, and I am being challenged um, to live my life for Jesus just like everybody else. And just being able to admit to myself that I still have a sinful heart. Oh, man. I think for a long time I thought, well, I shouldn't have a sinful heart. You know, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a new creature in Christ. Well, I still have a sinful heart. Yeah. And the Puritans are right. They called it indwelling sin. Yeah. And you never, you never finished with that fight until you're done. Yeah. I love this picture uh, from The Mortification of Sin, um, uh, John Owen's book, and he talks about sin being this this seed or this weed in your garden that you can continue to dig up 
and destroy and burn and you know cut out and it continues to grow in your life like you can't get rid of it uh, and it's this perpetual you have to do something about it or your garden is wrecked um, but you can't ever you know like get ahead to where it's like hey cool I'm gonna cut this out and for seven months I'm gonna have sin free issues right it's something that you're continually killing right. in your life yeah. Right. I wanted to ask you about something. He had a uh, section on the book of 1 John. Uh, John tells us at the end of the book, at the end of the epistle, that he writes these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. And he lays out three requirements or, or indicators or however you want to describe that. And it would be easy to turn 1 John into a legalistic epistle. Back to checklist uh, spirituality. Yeah. Talk about that chapter and what it meant for you. Yeah, so uh, this this reminded me of a time. So Trevor Rag and I were uh, leading a small group. Um, I'm going to say community group now. <laughs> it was a small group at the time, and we were going through First John with our community group, and uh, that was such a transformational time going through that book because it's such a black and white. And I, I remember listening to Kevin DeYoung's sermons as I was preparing myself to teach. And he points out these, he calls them signposts, and, and he references that in, the, in Impossible Christianity. But there's three signposts that uh, every Christian ought to have. There's the theological, what you believe about God. There's the moral, how you live your life. And then the social, how you love other believers. And this is not a do this in order to earn or maintain your salvation. This is evidence. If you're looking to see, does someone truly love Jesus and obey him? These are, the, these are things that should be evident in the person's life. And so as you read through First John, you see these three signposts continually um, listed uh, and, and stated and if you were in uh, that, that uh, community group at the time, you probably can still rattle those three signposts off because we talked about them all the time yeah. regularly. Um, I, I just think it's important that I, wa- I want to go and look at some of the, the passages. So, in this, again, this is all in First John, but 2, 5 through 6, by this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And 3.10, he says, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, and nor is the one who does not love his brother. 3.14, We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. And there, I mean, we could just keep going on and on and on, but the, these signposts are evidence so that we may know. Uh, this, is, uh, this should be an encouragement to us. Do you see this fruit bear, uh, being born out or, or lived out in your life or, or not? And I, I, love how, I love how black and white it is. It's like, look, either you love God or you don't. There's not this partial love or this partial obedience. So uh, chapter 5 deals with the question of corporate or collective guilt, which is a big topic in today's cultural moment. And I I liked it so much because he he handled it with such wisdom, I thought. Mm. Um, Somebody came up to me Sunday. She said she had a friend who's... uh, uh, she had gone to a church, and there was a litany that was read at their church about the, the guilt of whites. And she said, part two is coming up this coming Sunday, and I don't know what to tell her. And, uh, you know, this is a, this is a big problem. Uh, De, De, De Young says in his book, sometimes life feels like 10,000 victims on the side of the road, and we are told we must be the good Samaritans in every instance. And I thought that was a good word picture. That's, yeah. that's really true. You know, how do we manage that sort of thing? I think, first of all, we have to acknowledge there is a real problem. Uh, we have sinned as a people, and we do benefit from past injustice. And it would be foolish for us to deny that. That much is true. Uh, when I taught current social problems at Dayton Christian, I was trying to help my students understand this dilemma, and I had used a, uh, an illustration 
you are a race official for a multi-day bike race. And halfway through the race, you discover that fans of the first place, uh, the, the guy who's in first place, have been interfering with the, uh, the guy who's in second place. They've been, they've been holding him back. Now, what do you do about this? Do you penalize the guy who's in first place? You know that his lead is to some degree artificial, but you don't know how much. You don't even know if he should be in first place. Yeah. Do you penalize him? Uh, or do you just say no more cheating, but then the uh, the deficit is still there and the deficit was ill-gained? How do you do that? I just put my students into that to try to help them work through that. Um, just think, um, sometimes as we're recording, this is in January during our real cold snap, and we got brutal temperatures out there. Mm. And sometimes in an Ohio winter, I will think, you know what? I'm going from a warm house to a car that I can warm up. And I'm going to go to a warm building. And uh, there were people who had to live with these temperatures that didn't have all these advantages. I think about the pioneers. I think about the Indians who list, the Native Americans used to live in this part of the world. And I realize, you know, the only evidence we have that there were other people groups living here are place names. We are in the Miami Valley. And the Miami Valley got its name from a group of people who used to live here. And that gives me pause to think about that. Hmm. I, I recognize. But we have to distinguish between two kinds of sorrow. When I say I am sorry about that, I am sorry that Katrina destroyed New Orleans. Hurricane Katrina destroyed New Orleans. Now, I had no part in that, but I am so sorry. That's a sorrow of empathy, and I'm sorry that happened. And I'm sorry for what my forefathers did to other people. I'm from the South, and I would imagine you wouldn't have to go too far back into my own family history to find some real racism. I even saw it in, my, in some of my grandparents as I was growing up. Mm. Yeah. But there's another kind of guilt, and that's the guilt. And there's another kind of sorrow, and that's the sorrow of remorse. And that's where you're taking responsibility yourself for what you've done. And I like what DeYoung had to say about this, and I'm going to go ahead and read. This is from page 80. Uh -huh. I thought he did such a good job. It is, is it a workable ethic for anyone to insist that every connection to human sinfulness, past or present, renders us culpable for that sin? There's the question. Even if we could rid ourselves of every place and every institution tainted by slavery, for example, could we be sure that what remained was never built by people who exploited others and never financed by people who made their money through sinful enterprise? Do not all our favorite streaming services make money, at least in part, by the commodification of sex? Aren't many of our movie studios and some of our favorite sports leagues complicit in aiding and abetting a government that disregards basic human rights? Are we sure about the purity of our mutual funds or of the clothes and shoes that are manufactured overseas or of the labor practices of the online retailers we use every day? And what of the products we enjoy or the ones we don't even know we're benefiting from? that may have ties to companies complicit in past crimes and aggressions of other countries. Christian obedience becomes impossible when, instead of the basics of putting off the works of the flesh and putting on the fruits of the Spirit, as Paul said in Galatians 5 and Colossians 3, we are called to account for every unpopular ism, every broken system, and every bad thing we see in too much of the culture. I thought he did a good job of... And then he, he uh, goes on to say... Culpability for sins committed can extend to a large group if virtually everyone in the group was or active in the sin or if we bear the same spiritual resemblance to perpetrators of the past, if we are continuing that. Mm. And then finally, he said at the, at the last chapter, the, the last paragraph in chapter 5, living life in the present is hard enough without the impossible burden of owning the sins of the past as well. To be sure... Our parents can give us huge advantages or disadvantages in life, and on a cosmic scale known only to God, some of us enter this world with more privileges than others. We should also add that past sins can be recognized and renounced, as they should be, even if we are not required to specifically repent of them. And I like that distinction. The sins of the past are far from irrelevant, and yet we are not meant to live with a sense of corporate guilt for an ethnic, racial, or biological identity we did not choose and from which we cannot be free. Self-flagellation is not a requirement for spiritual maturity. It is one thing for us to love God and love our neighbors. 
is quite another if the call of Christian discipleship means we must, on account of the failures of others, hate ourselves. So I liked how he handled that very delicate issue. He acknowledges that, yes, there is injustice in our past, and our parents, our forefathers were responsible for that, and we have to deal with that, but we don't deal with that by hating ourselves. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, obviously we want to talk about this. This is a a very delicate topic, right? Volatile. Uh, It's very volatile. Uh, You know, it feels like this is a, a, a minefield, uh, when we want to talk about this, especially in, in light of the last several years, um, you know, this is this is us not trying to introduce woke concepts, but all of you listening to this are hearing these themes in the news, at work, at school, and rather than just treating it as a taboo subject that can't be talked about, I think it's important that we we kind of engage a little bit of how do we as Christians think about the, these circumstances. And I, I think one of the, the issues that I saw as we, we looked at this is certainly, uh, maybe, uh, I have some benefit uh, from people in my past. Now, I, I've tried to do some of the genealogy. I'm not really sure after a certain time period, you know, what, where, where my family uh, arrives from and, and whatnot. But if the gospel is about sinning against a holy God and me needing to reconcile with him alone and only being able to do that through Jesus Christ, then the concept of reconciling with a people group today whose ancestors were offended by other people who I also don't know, that gets very difficult. If you try to if you try to, you know, step through that, what does that look like? If I, if I meet someone who, who perhaps my ancestors uh, did something, you know, wrong to their ancestors, and I apologize to them, am I, am I good at that point? Or do I have to go to every single person in the world possible before I feel that guilt is taken care of? And so I think that that's the wrong motive certainly if you have the opportunity to talk with someone about these things, and, and, and that's wonderful when you can, there's nothing wrong with saying, man, I'm really sorry that that happened. That, that's awful. Yeah, but that's a, that's a personal relationship yeah. with somebody, and you wouldn't walk up to a black man on the street or a Native American on the street that you didn't know and apologize. Yeah, they'd be like, that who are you? <laughs> you? Yeah, you with a, with a friend, a person of color, and say, I get it, and I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, but, but I think— It's a different conversation. But I think, you know, it muddies the gospel— if, if we think that, yeah, i got to reconcile to God, but I also have to reconcile to everyone that I possibly can meet, that, that kind of takes away the wrongness, uh, the sin, uh, to you know, who you have sinned against. So what we're saying is chapter 5, I think, alone is worth the price of the book. Oh, my. I think, he'd, I think yes. he, I've never heard another Christian leader really deal with the question the way he did, and I liked it. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, so, you know, what, you know, what are some of the, what are some of the final takeaways uh, that you would, would offer for this book? You know, why is, what else would we want to, to share that maybe would entice people to read it, uh, but also to encourage them? Well, you and I both came up with a good quote, so I want you to read yours from page 118, and then I'll close with my quote. Okay. Um, yeah, l- let this be an encouragement to you. <laughs> uh, even if you leave everything behind, become a missionary, and live among an unreached people who you, you live, I'm sorry, your life, your life on most days will be predictable. After a while, it will likely feel quite ordinary. No matter where we live as Christians, life will be filled with a lot of the same things. Eating, sleeping, cleaning, laughing, crying, taking care of kids, going to church, or gathering with other believers as we try to plant a church. Praying, reading our Bibles, trying to get along with others, and seeking to make a difference in others' lives. If God isn't happy with normal life, He's not going to be happy with most of us because normal is what most of our days are like. And then I liked how he said it this way. There must be a way for followers of Jesus to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, apart from being political operatives, 
full-time bloggers, or community organizers. <laughs> yeah. So highly recommended, uh, Impossible Christianity by Kevin DeYoung. Would you say, Paul, that the, 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 the main takeaway here is Christianity is not about doing some huge thing or, or being able to address every single issue that's out there. Yeah. But it's about being faithful to, to Jesus in your daily walk. Right. And sometimes that's going to look extremely ordinary and plain and monotonous. Yeah, and then there are times that we'll be called to do something difficult and awkward and have an awkward conversation, yeah. but not all the time. Yeah. Uh, and it, being a Christian doesn't mean you have to say something about everything all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, next time that we get together, I'll be interviewing Noel and hear his story of how he came to Jesus. I actually don't know that story, so I'll be interested to hear it. All right. Thanks. We'll see you next time. Join us next time for Talk in the Park, Conversations with Paul and Noel. Be sure to check out the Discipleship Weekly blog. Look for it at pattersonpark.org under the Resources tab. Talk in the Park is a production of Patterson Park Church, audio engineering by John Ambro, music composed, performed, and recorded by Jason McClurg. Talk in the Park is copyright Patterson Park Church, no duplication or copying permitted.